Thanks for joining us, and welcome to the Reptile Living Room, featuring John Taylor of Herp House Magazine and James Tintle with Cold-Blooded Publishing. The Reptile Living Room is brought to you by Herp House Magazine, the premier digital magazine for the reptile hobbyist, and by Cold-Blooded Publishing, your exclusive reptile media publishing company. Now, here are John and James in the Reptile Living Room. James, you in there? I am. How are you? Oh, gosh. I'm beat. Tired. Dead tired. But, regardless of how tired I am, <laughs> we're live, finally. So, <laughs> After a few little... I, uh, had a wonderful week yourself, huh? Yeah, it, it was quite interesting. <laughs> it was definitely quite interesting, that's for sure. And running behind schedule here tonight, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, it happens. Um, let's see, we had, uh, where are we at? We're doing field herping tonight with uh, Jeff Mintz is the one we're trying to get on board. And he's having a couple of snafus with his uh, connection over there. We also have Chip Cochran and a friend of yours, uh, yep. if I'm not mistaken, Rhett. Yep, we have Rhett Stanberry. So he's awesome. another Floridian over here. <laughs> You and you Floridians, we got to get some more Canadians on this show, you know what I'm telling you. Hey, people <laughs> on icebergs live in Iggy Loos. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, hey, I got my um, Blue Maestro in for you my did. birthday. Check it out. Awesome. Check Dude, it out, you man. are wicked awesome, cool. Got it all hooked up. Um, works great. I actually just brought it out of the room. Works great. I hooked up. App works fine. Just trying to figure out a couple little things about it, and then um, we'll be good to go. So uh, I'll talk to Kirsten over the next week or so and, and get all the fine little details on that. But uh, I like it. I like yeah. it. I really liked it when I when I first got mine and uh, set it up. It was just so easy to do. Just a really great piece of technology. Very um, very user friendly, uh, which was really nice for me. Because technology and I don't get along, obviously. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and for anybody that wants to know what a blue maestro is, it's actually a temperature gauge um, that hooks up with an app to your phone. So you can set it in the cage, in the incubator, wherever you want, and you can actually read the temperature where it's at without disturbing it. So it all automatically comes to your cell phone in an app form, and it'll record. Um, you can set it to record every hour, every half hour, every 15 minutes, and uh, it'll record that data for you. So it's a great little piece of technology, that's for sure. Very awesome. BlueMaestro.com is where you guys can find those. Um, Jimmy, we had a couple more shout-outs, didn't we, for um, um, Happy Gecko's uh, Sticky Situation, Rachel Winchin? Yep, yep. I wanted to mention her tonight. Um, so... Looks like she's got a few, uh, couple cool little stickers out. I've been following her on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, Rachel's done some pretty incredible work as far as uh, printing stickers, and I think she's on to magnets now already. And she's doing various magnets. Basically anything you can think of reptile-wise or invertebrate-wise, she can create a sticker out of it for you. Yeah. And that's uh, Rachel Winchin over at uh, Happy Gecko Sticky Situation. And, of course, our show sponsor this evening, as always, Cold-Blooded Publishing, which is where you pick up your copy of The Guide to Hunter and Milk Snakes, written by Mr. James Tinnell himself. As well and as Douglas Doug. Mong. And Doug Mung, yes, yep. definitely. Uh, he may have had some role in that in the writing of that epic <laughs> novel of a Herpeticulture <laughs> book, you know. Actually, Doug, <laughs> Doug is a... Um, world of information. I don't know how he shoves it all between two years that he has, but he's like the encyclopedia sometimes. Um, oh, and then we got to do a shout out to Herp House Mag. What's going on over there, man? All oh, kinds man. of changes to the website. Oh my gosh, changes to the website. Build your own reptile magazine. It's finally functional the way it should be. It's not perfect yet. We're still working on it, but it's still functional. What you can do is you can actually for the past uh, four volumes of issues, you can actually go in and grab any single article. 
whether it be uh, Kluber Corner, um, Herpetic Ultra 101, any single article, go to the website, uh, build your own reptile magazine right there, uh, herphousemag.com. Grab as many articles as you want for 99 cents. And if you use TTC, I think it's 30. Is yeah, it that's, my, that's my code, code? though. <laughs> they, uh, they get uh, 30% off, and there's a bunch, other, uh, bunch of our affiliates out there that if you just ask around in different circles and stuff like that, you guys can get yourselves a really sweet discount, uh, 30% site-wide. Great. Superpowsmag.com. I tell you what, and it makes life easy just going to those uh, single additional articles. Um, I noticed you had some freebies floating around there too. People can grab some freebies. Very, very definitely. There is some freebies. Uh, your article uh, that you recently did, Spotted Mexican Milk Snakes, is the freebie this week. And then next week we are going to change it to be the article written by Dr. Sean McCormick of Inbreeding and Reptiles. Great. And then, uh, every week or so we're going to change it up to give away a different article. Uh, we'll never give away all the articles, uh, but we'll give away different key articles that people are uh, show most interest in and stuff like that. So definitely come by, grab a free article. Uh, you can also grab a free issue if you want. Just check it out. And if you guys want to know, it's herphousemag.com. It's also in the event pages, and it'll be listed below in YouTube. Um, so visit them. There are sponsors for this show, so um, and keeps us on the air. So, anything else going on there, John? Um, other than moving, no. <laughs> I, I have I have a couple more shout-outs that I want to do because of the incident that I had earlier this week. Um, yeah. uh, Shannon Hammer um, contacted me today. Go visit her. I think it's Cold-Blooded Creations. Um, order a piece of artwork from her. She uh, um, wanted to make one to help me out and auction it off, but um, go by there. <clears throat> talk to her. She's a great gal and does some awesome work. Also, Michael Hyduck from Germany. Um, he personally called me just to make sure that everything was okay. So, Michael, thanks a lot. Um, just wanted to give you a personal shout out there. So, with all that said, let's go ahead and um, hit this show. Uh, hopefully, we can get Jeff on here. I know Chad's working with him. Yep. Um, we won't bother Chad right now, but if everybody sees him, he's down in the lower, I think, right hand for most people. Um, talking on the cell phone there. He's our executive producer, so hopefully we'll get Jeff on here pretty soon. Um, you want to go ahead and, it, and let's introduce Chip first. Yeah, uh, Chip Cochran. How are you, sir? <laughs> doing pretty well. How you doing? Awesome. Long time no see, so how you been these days? Oh, I can't complain. Really busy lately. Got a couple conferences coming up, so uh, not going to be getting much sleep for the next few days. <laughs> <laughs> and Chip, you're uh, you're still at Loma Linda, is that correct? Yeah, I'm still at Loma Linda. Okay, awesome. So Chip joins us from uh, Loma Linda University, which I don't want to say was made famous by, but is probably most well known for the Venom ER series, uh, which I forget the network that, that appeared on, but that was uh, Dr. Sean Bush. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, doing the uh, Loma Linda series there with uh, venomous reptiles. Basically, it was people get bit, they come to Loma Linda, get treated by Dr. Sean Bush. Uh, Chip Cochran, on the other hand, uh, does a lot of various studies in venom as well as constantly. It's like every time you call you know, Chip, he's in the field. He's never at home. He's never at work. He's just in the field. That's what Chip does. <laughs> now, Chip, uh, give us some background on uh, your latest exploits as far as uh, what you're working on this year. So I'm still working on my uh, PhD project, which is looking at geographic venom variation in speckled rattlesnakes. Uh, so basically I'm spending my entire summer out in different mountain ranges across the southwest, and uh, hopefully in the next month I'll get my Mexican permits and head on down to Baja. Very cool. That is awesome. Now, Chip, uh, actually, Chip, uh, what does it take to get permits in order to actually get out in the field and go field herping in, di in different countries? Obviously, it varies country by country, but if you can give us a little bit of background. All right, so if you just want to go field herping 
there's there's a difference between if you're actually looking to do a scientific project and is if you just want to go get say photos. Um, some states you actually don't need to have anything and carry anything if you just want photos. Others um, term touching the animal, uh, picking it up, moving it across the road is a form of potential harassment. So you need to get a hunting license. So for instance, in Arizona, you got to buy a hunting license there if you want to go and just get photos. Um, for what I'm doing, for me to take scale clips. Um, venom samples, publish in journals, I have to get a scientific collecting permit and that also varies by state. Some states charge money, um, for instance California charges a fee for me to be able to do my research. Other states like Arizona don't charge any money. Um, that's if you're also working with, there's differences between protected and non-protected species so if I wanted to work with say Willard I Obscurus I would also need a federal permit. Um, luckily the species I'm doing my work on isn't federally protected so I just need the different state permits for the states that you can find it in and then for Mexico I need an additional permit on top of that which I'm hoping will come in in the next month but you have to you know no researchers down there work with them and that's how they um, get you in touch with the right people in government oh man <laughs> that sounds like a heck of a process to be going through just to uh, play with some snakes I think I'll stick with just the uh, photographing and stuff like that, and I'll leave the you know, scientific stuff to you folks. <laughs> now, Rhett, uh, do you have any uh, scientific background as far as um, your experiences uh, with snakes and things of that nature? Uh, no, not really. Um, all I really did is I graduated from UCF with an environmental science degree, but besides that, all my field stuff is just um, more of a, not necessarily a hobby, more of like a lifelong passion. So. Okay. And right while I got you here, uh, how did you actually first discover your um, interest in reptiles, shall we say? Oh, man. It, uh, it started probably at age, I was told age three with the Ninja Turtles. I got obsessed huh. with the Ninja Turtles, yeah. <laughs> and it was turtles growing up, and my dad was actually a wildlife photographer. So we traveled the state of Florida photographing wildlife. And I was always looking for turtles. I was crawling around the woods, flipping logs, catching little snakes and lizards, and it just grew from there. And it's been as long as I can remember. That is awesome. Now, as far as uh, field therapy is concerned, are you more of the photograph and leave alone, or do yeah. you want to bring them back to the to a central location and then photograph them in a stage presence, or do you like NC yeah. photographs better? I like NC2 or out in the field shots. And okay. I only really do photograph. I don't do any collecting or anything like that. Awesome. Very cool. And uh, as far as uh, field collection, what type of uh, what type of stuff are you looking for? Is it just pretty much anything that comes across your path, or do you have a specific target species that you're looking for usually? Or it depends. Sometimes I have a target, and other times I like to just go explore different places and find different species, or how many different species I can find. I typically like black exploration times because when you target a species and you don't find that species, you kind of feel a little bummed out. But um, it's a little bit of both. It really just kind of depends on what I feel like going looking for. Okay. Fair enough. Now, uh, as far as Chip is concerned, Chip, when did you first discover your uh, passion or interest in reptiles there? Uh, same story about as long as I can remember. Actually, some of my <laughs> earliest memories are growing up with my brothers chasing frogs and snakes around our house in New Hampshire, so absolutely as long as I can remember. Awesome. Very cool. Now, uh, as far as your field work, I know you're doing more of the, or doing most of the uh, scientific work. When you get into the scientific work, does is there a lot of room left over to have still have the fun and enjoyment that you, you know, originally had as a kid growing up chasing reptiles, or does that kind of go to the wayside because now you're more focused on the scientific side of things? Oh, there's still plenty of time where it's, I mean, I have a blast every time I'm out there, and I still make sure I, you know, book in enough just for fun trips with something that I'm not studying so I can uh, take time away from the actual project for a few days. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Now, um, as far as taking photographs and things of that nature, is there any specific equipment that you take out, Chip, as far as uh, when you're doing photographs in the field or anything like that, or is it just kind of a point-and-shoot? Or Yeah, I just have a point-and-shoot. I don't have the money for a nice camera. <laughs> I'm a grad student. Yeah, yeah those uh, student loans and you know all the financing for schools, that usually kills any dreams of... <laughs> 
large equipment purchases. Now, Rhett, how about you? Anything uh, specific that you take out in the field with you as far as uh, when you go out herping? Yeah, I I um I just switched from a point and shoot and I got a DSLR. It's a Nikon D7100 and I usually use a 60 millimeter macro. I didn't have enough money to buy a whole bunch of different lenses, so I have that and then the 18 to 105 kit. And um, besides that, I usually just carry backpack, food, water, and a snake hook in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> in the eyes, those are always good to have. <clears throat> now, Red, who first introduced you to uh, reptiles and field herping? Oh, you know, my first uh, field herping memory, I, I don't know if we could call it field herping because, you know, I would just walk around and around my yard and stuff and catch stuff. I remember one of my friends climbed a tree. This is one of my first snake memories. He stuck his hand in the tree hole. Well, he climbed the tree in there's a hole. He stuck his hand in, and a rat snake bit it. And he pulled out, and he had a rat snake on his hand. I was like, oh, that's the coolest thing ever. (laughs) Ever since then, we had this little uh, railroad tracks behind our neighborhood, and we'd walk those railroad tracks. And there was all kinds of uh, snakes and turtles, and we just grew up catching snakes and turtles. And then, you know, I guess I got a bike, and I'd start riding my bike to different places to catch more snakes. And then I got a car, and I started driving different places. And... (laughs) You just kept graduating on and on. Pretty soon you're just going to buy a yacht, you know, travel to Jamaica. Oh, that's the the dream. (laughs) Very cool. Uh, Chip, same question to you, sir. Who uh, first got you, uh, who first introduced you to field herping in the uh, wild outdoors, as it were? Yeah, mine was just the yard, too. Um, I actually, it was interesting because the internet kind of started getting big around when I was like, I'd say 12. You get those little free AOL disc and stuff like that in the mail that you could put in. Oh, yeah. And that was when I kind of le- learned more that there was a lot of other people who were into this because of the the forum. Like King, the old kingsnake.com was like the first site that I got on online. And that's when I started seeing that there was other people around who actually were really into this too. Beforehand, it was, you know, me and my brothers were the only people who I knew that would go out just for fun to go look for, you know, frogs and snakes and stuff. Wow. So basically it was almost like um, connecting to a larger community then uh, when you first got introduced to it then. Yeah, I hadn't actually herped with people that were I was not blood related to until I moved to Arizona for my freshman year in college. Wow. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah, because for me personally, I've always... Um, Growing up, you know, I knew there were snakes there, but I just never was really into catching them. It was just part of the wildlife that, you know, you didn't mess with. You see rabbits, you know, coyotes, whatever, you just didn't mess with the wildlife. And then not until later on, gosh, my late 20s, um, started keeping in captivity and then found out that, you know, oh, my gosh, we can actually go out and see these things in the wild? That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, late bloomer here for me. Gosh, unfortunately. How about you, Jimmy? When did you get started? Oh, man, I was young. I was young. <laughs> See, I missed uh, the boat. My, Everybody got started way before I did. My first interaction with, with reptiles was uh, probably like six. Um, but my first interaction with, with snakes was probably around seven or so. And my grandmother, of all people, what? my grandmother used to take me up to the well. And when the garter snakes would be born inside the well um, she would flip open the lid and we were actually reach down and she would grab a handful of baby garters and just put them up on top of the well and I would play with them and oh, it was great that was kind of my first real interaction and of all people my grandmother my grandfather who was like 6'3 350 pounds uh, the guy was so scared of snakes I, I we actually had little tongs that he would pick them up and move them out of the yard <laughs> so I remember as a little kid riding on the front of the riding lawnmower, and I was his eyes for snakes so he wouldn't run them over. And I'd be like, stop, stop, stop. And then I'd jump off the lawnmower, go catch him, and I'd put him over the fence so he could finish mowing the lawn. So that was kind of my first introduction in the wild. But um, I, I spend nowhere near um, the amount of time that I would love to out in the field. Um, hoping that as I grow older, I'll have more and more time. But at this point, I, I don't spend anywhere near the amount of time that I would lo- I'd like to. I hear you. I hear you on that. I don't. 
I've only been out in the field here in Canada twice, and I've already been here a year, and it's just not enough time in the day. Well, you got to shovel snow to find something, don't you? <laughs> Whatever. Even in the middle of May. <laughs> it was a bad winter. I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> speaking about bad winters, um, any, anybody have any superstitions as far as when they go field herping? Uh, Chip, anything for you as far as superstitions or like good luck charms or anything like that that you carry around? I don't really have any superstitions. I, uh, I It does feel funny every time I have to new, buy a new backpack, though. Like I don't know why, but I form attachments to my field packs. I think it might be because you know you take them everywhere, and then you have the memories of the packs, and then when they wear completely thin, you start off with this new one. So I don't know. I, I do get a weird feeling every time I have to buy a new pack. That's understandable. So no favorite, uh, no favorite snake hook or lucky snake hat or nothing, huh? Just the nah, no, no favorite hook, no hat. That's a favorite. Um, I, a lot of things get worn out pretty quickly with me, so the, the yeah. pack's the one that kind of lasts the longest. Now, speaking of uh, wearing out equipment, how, on a uh, rough guess, actually, what amount of time do you actually spend in the field when you're on a project? Oh, I have no idea. I, I, I probably spend, oh, man, that's, that's hard to compute, actually. I, I, <laughs> months and months and months and months and months in the field. I'm, I'm usually out camping in different ranges if there's no classes going on. And since I just finished my last coursework, I actually now can just be doing data collection before I you know, come back in the winter and start to analyze. Right, right. Okay, and uh, Chip, not to cut you off there, um, we just, it looks like we do have Jeff, actually, uh, coming in. Jeff Mintz, a uh, good friend of ours, Field Herper. We're trying to get his microphone to work. Do we get that working for you, Jeff? Um, looks like he has it shut off. Jeff, if you can unmute your mic, you should be able to talk. Possibly? To unmute, it's just uh, just above my head. If you hover over, there should be a little microphone with a slash through it. If you click it, it should be able to unmute. Okay, well, we're going to have uh, Chad work with Jeff on unmuting his microphone. And, uh, Rhett, what is your, uh, any favorite uh, superstitions or favorite hats or hooks or any equipment like that for you, sir? Well, same as uh, Chip, I kind of go through gear really fast. <laughs> this <laughs> shirts, jeans, boots, they never <laughs> backpacks. Um, I do have, I brought it kind of, this is, uh, you see it, my favorite snake hook. It's just a, a rod that I bent and uh, tapped a hole in a shovel handle, put it in, and it's lasted a long time. But, How long have um, you had that, actually? Yeah. And that, that's my favorite hook, and that's the one I always take with me. If I don't have it in my hand when I'm out in the field, I feel kind of naked without it. <laughs> <laughs> this is temporarily my favorite hat until it runs out. And, you know. <laughs> until it runs out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, who, who, uh, who establishes uh, when things run out? Is there a significant other for anybody out there that like, you know, comes in and says, Okay, that stinks and it's dead. Throw that away now or you're not coming in the house. Anybody else got that yet or no? <laughs> no, mine's mine's more of uh, like for the backpack when I'm worried about it actually ripping and not holding the contents. Uh, the boots when the soles are uh, worn through. I, I guess that would potentially be considered a, a superstition. Like there's only one brand of boots I'll buy and it's because of the only ones that hold up for any length of time whatsoever. Well, heck, give them a shout out, please. We gotta uh, know what you're well, the, so I, the, the only brand of boot that I actually end up buying and wearing around is it's called Danner, is the company name. And I usually uh, get the model called Pronghorn. And they don't sponsor me, but they could. And that would be <laughs> we should get them to sponsor you, Chip. <laughs> I'll put them on the sponsor list, John. Exactly. We're going to look into that for Chip. <laughs> and. Uh, now, Jim, Jimmy, what about you? Any superstitions for you, sir? No, I don't spend enough time out in the field to really have any superstitions. Um, 
I mean, it's pretty much hit or miss, general, you know, hey, I have a day off, I have a couple hours, let me go hit, you know, uh, the mangroves type of deal for me. So that's pretty much no superstitions on that front. Okay. Uh, other areas of life, yeah, I have superstitions. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask. <laughs> now, as far as uh, speaking of brands and tools and things of that nature, uh, Chip mentioned the uh, Danner company and the pronghorn uh, boots that he likes. Uh, Rhett, any specific hooks or anything as far as cameras, uh, other than the Nikon you just bought, obviously? Um, as far as hooks, bags, um, anything else that you take out with you on a regular basis? Emergency kit. Uh, public spring water. That's a bad <laughs> That, that's about it. I, I don't have any favorites. I just I might take Chip up on or take advice from Chip and try those pronghorn boots though, because none of the boots I ever buy last. Posting <laughs> the best pro, and I look around like, oh, they're on sale. I'll get them. They'll last a couple months, and then <laughs> go on to the next one and the next one. So yeah, not I know the feeling. <laughs> Nothing lasts these days. Do you guys do you guys pack any emergency equipment? Band-Aids, Neosporin, trinkets, anything. I mean, we all pretty much hurt. I mean, Chip, you're out in California. Rhett, you're in Florida. We're all around venomous stuff. So it, do you guys pack anything just in case? Yeah, I, I actually have a uh, little emergency kit that I picked up at um, like an REI. Uh, just the basics, um, stuff in case of a sprain, um, different bandages, little alcohol swabs, things like that. I also carry EpiPens, but that's because I'm fairly certain that I'm actually allergic to venom, um, in particular because of keeping snakes for a long time and then uh, working with species like spitting cobras where you end up inhaling a lot of the venom and getting it on you. So I've noticed that uh, now when I open vials of lyophilized venom, I kind of go into a big sneezing fit, so I... Uh, I carry a few EpiPens to uh, try to help if anything was to go really bad. Obviously a cell phone if that's in range and service and works. And then I, uh, I definitely tell you know a few people where I'm going and when to expect back from me and or to hear back from me because sometimes I'll even give like a daily check-in just so that somebody knows you know hey he didn't call at you know eight o'clock if there's a spot that's close enough to a road and I know that I'll get service. Otherwise it'll be hey, if you don't hear from me in four days, like, come, you know, come on out to this place. Four days, that's a pretty long time. <laughs> <laughs> the coyotes and everything and buzzards I have you by then. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Rhett? Anything uh, um, emergency-wise do you pack in that uh, bag? Um, I've got a few, like, butterfly Band-Aids for any, like, deep cuts, some hand sanitizer, um, I have a compass and my cell phone, and besides that, I probably am pretty unprepared in that way. <laughs> wow. And, and I would assume you guys both carry <laughs> drinks. I mean, we we all pretty much herp in some pretty hot areas, and actually um, snake day is going on out in East Sanderson this weekend. Um, so do you guys carry, like, uh, protein bars just in case the truck breaks down? And this is going to lead into my next question, too, as well. Yeah, it actually kind of depends on what I'm doing. If I know I'm basing out of my car, I'll have stuff with a cooler and things like that. So I'll have food for, you know, a week or two, depending on how long I'm staying out. And I'll have enough dried food in different containers that I bring. If I'm doing a backpacking trip into the mountains for, you know, a few days to a week, I'll have purchased uh, beforehand a few freeze-dried uh, food items that will fit in a big pack. And I have my little, you know, little jet boil stove that I have out there and can cook up everything. So I'll bring enough water that'll fit in my Camelback. Things like that. I'll have uh, usually the powdered Gatorade to add some electrolytes because then I can just uh, reconstitute that with some water and good to go to add the salts back in that you've been sweating out. Right, right. What about you, uh, Rhett? Any food-wise? Any? I'm I'm not out. In, I'm not out for the extended period of time that chips out. I usually bring you know like Cliff bars and protein bars, granola bars, some beef jerky, and but plenty of water. I always take enough water and more water than I probably need, just in case. And then I also know like a lot of the uh, edible plants and stuff, just in case. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, that's about not it. Not a bad idea at all, man. Knowing knowing what 
edible plants are out there, and specifically to the area where you're at, that's smart on your part for sure. Definitely, definitely. Um, let's see. We actually have a couple questions, um, and, and this is going to kind of lead into. Uh, we have a question from Paula Cummings, um, and she says, "Do you consider field herping and road cruising to be the same thing? And can you describe how much area you generally cover in a day? And do you spend most of your time looking for snakes in your favorite spots or trying new areas?" And I think Rhett, I think you answered that last part of that question already. That you, you pretty much go out um, for you know, new, new places, but what about, um, uh, field herping and road cruising? Do you do both? Yeah, there's a time and place for everything, I guess. Uh, certain snakes and certain times, certain conditions are better to road cruise. I personally prefer, like, field herping. I call myself, like, a, you know, a lot of the herpers now, they just drive, it seems they just drive roads and drive roads, and just about any snake in Florida can be found on a road, but it's not the same experience. I still call myself a snake hunter because I like to go out in the woods and look for them in their natural habitat. There's a lot that you get to see when you're out in the field that you're not going to find when you're cruising for snakes. So in my opinion, it's not really the same thing. I always thought cruising is something separate as field herping. But right. They're sep the same thing but different, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Just different entities of the, yeah, uh, of, right. yeah. out there field herping. All right. Um, how much area do you usually cover? Um, in a day? Oh, it depends if I'm hiking or where I go. Like, certain places I've got loops that I'll hike, you know, like long loops. There's one that's probably about seven miles. Um, it goes down to the St. John's, around the St. John's, then back up and around. Um, if I'm cruising, I can cover hundreds of miles because I drive fast and just try and cover as much ground as I can and look as fast as I can for little snakes crossing. But um, hiking, you know, if you're camping, you'll spend a lot of time out there. And I really couldn't even say how many, but I know certain loops are seven miles, others are two and five, but never much more than that. Right. What about you, Chip? Um, do you road cruise or just kind of out there uh, bushwhacking it and hiking I, it I, along? Uh, I've, I've done both for multiple different projects. I've, I've used both methods, but uh, I personally prefer to be hiking. Um I'll use road cruising, but it really only works if the snakes are up and on the move. You're, I personally find I have a lot more success if I'm, you know, out hiking on nights when stuff's not moving. Um, and then you can get a little bit better male-to-female ratio if you're also hiking as opposed to road cruising. So I, I do like them both. I do consider them different things. I personally prefer to be hiking because if I'm seeing the snake on the road... Well, each snake that I see on the road is the same kind of pose. I prefer to be out where, you know, maybe I'll see this one in an ambush position coiled up waiting for a kangaroo rat to come by, or two males more likely to be, you know, chasing females that are in some rock, you know, pile somewhere. So I, I consider them different, but I, uh, I do do them both. And as far as distance is covered, um, easy, depends on where I'm at. Um, if I'm hiking and looking in specifically one canyon for animals that I know are there, like if I'm doing a telemetry study, then I might spend, you know, in a small area a great deal of time. If I'm just out moving around in a range trying to find more animals, it can be, you know, over easily over 10 miles. Right, right. Now going with that, do you, um, doing the studies, I know you get kind of insights from previous uh, herpers out there, field herpers looking for specific species. Do you do you generally like to try to cover new area that other people haven't covered already, or do you much rather go to the places where you kind of know the species is is there and has been located already? It de depends on when I'm starting and on what project it is. So, for instance, at University of Arizona, I was told where I'd be going. Uh, we had a study site that was involved was there's a golf course that was being built so we knew right where we'd be going this is what we're going to go study these are the areas we're going to study it in um, for my speckled rattlesnake project I'll look up um, records from museum collections and get mountain ranges if GPS co coordinates come along with those I will use those um, otherwise I'll use uh, Google Earth and I'll just get on a mountain range and I'll just with knowledge from finding the species before 
try to find areas that I think are good. I'll write down GPS coordinates to that or road directions, and then I'll just bring myself there. And then, Great. yeah, if, if there's somebody that says, hey, uh, you know, I've a ton of speckled rattlesnakes in this canyon, and I haven't done that mountain range yet, and they want to head on out there and show me, I take that too. There you go. There you go. All right. Hey, John, you want to take a, a quick uh, minute break here, and we can get up, stretch your legs, um, and show some sponsors for the show, and uh, we'll be back in about 60 seconds, guys. Sounds good. All right, and we're back. All right, John. So <laughs> let's see here. So we pretty much covered all the gear, superstitions. Let's kind of go into um, a little bit of weather conditions. Um, do you guys have specific times of years, moon cycles, um, that you like to cover? Or is it, hey, I have time to get out there. Let me go ahead and uh, um, get some data involved. Chip? Mine's much more of I'm going to be out there anyway, so <laughs> if it's bad weather conditions, I'm hoping that I find, you know, one animal at sometimes. I mean, there's definitely, depending on the species, conditions that prevail for each, you know, and send out a lot of animals for each one, and those can be completely different for, depending on what you're studying. But, uh, yeah, more the, uh, hey, I have, I have time. I'm out. I'm going to be out anyway. I don't care if the weather's awful. I'm still going to put the boots to the ground and hopefully turn one up. Now, just to piggyback on that before Red answers, and because it's going to be both both uh, Chip and Red uh, together can answer separately. Obviously, I've always heard uh, from several different field herpers um, the old um, fisherman's tale or wives' tale, however you want to term it, of uh, if it's a full moon, more uh, less animals will be out because of the full moon. Do you gent, gentlemen find that with uh, reptiles, the full, full moonlight? Either, on average? I'd yeah, say on best, average. But uh, I've definitely had killer nights on full moon nights. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah same here. All had right. a couple nights that had snakes moving on full moons. A lot okay. Of hmm. Interesting. It doesn't stop me from going out. <laughs> <laughs> Chip, I don't think there's anything that stops you from going out. <laughs> and there are certain weather conditions that are more preferable than others. Like, I'll do the same as Chip. Like, if I have this section of time, I'm going out regardless of the weather. But say a storm comes in, it rains. You know, in Florida, we can go and flip cover. The snakes go under the cover during the rains. Um, I always like when a storm's coming in, I might actually go road cruising because if there's a storm, you know, front coming through, it'll sometimes get the snakes moving. And I'm like, okay. I'll grab my dogs, hit the road, and we'll just, you know, run around if we see it's going to be really good weather conditions. Um, you know, like in Florida, we've got a lot of aquatic snakes. And so, you know, if it rains during the day, that night they might be cr crossing roads or walking around ponds. You'll see a lot of them. Um, also, after rains is really good. Like, not necessarily the day after, but two days after when the humidity is really up, it mm -hmm. really seems to get the snakes moving. So... Very interesting. We don't have quite as much water here in the southwest. Yeah. So <laughs> if it's going to rain, that's awesome because everybody's going to come up for a drink. 
Ah, oh, very true. If I, if I see rain's going to hit an area that I know hasn't had rain in a while, I will specifically change plans to head to that mountain range so that I can get the animals that are coming up to get water. Wow, okay. But definitely as far as, like, a front coming in, that's always been, like, the, you know, that just seems to be, like, a peak that gets everybody going, and I always try and go right before a front if I have the opportunity. Okay. Now, uh, another question I have for uh, both, of the, both of our guests tonight um, when you go to a certain spot or a favored spot, um, I've heard tales of obviously development or something else will basically take that favorite spot out. When that does happen, because it's obviously going to happen to everybody, we all know that the snakes disperse or reptiles or whatever that we're looking for disperse. Are you more likely to find them within the immediate area after dispersal, or do you find that they just all just disappear altogether? That would depend on the size and scope of what was done. Um, you know, if you have a new golf course being put in, things are just getting bulldozed and killed. Right. Uh, if you were to have, you know, some, like a single house get put up, you, you, you might find, you know, the animals have moved on to other areas, but so it would, it would all depend on size and scope. Okay. But I haven't personally spent enough time in the early stages of development of an area uh, with you know marked animals to right. guess exactly where they've gone. Okay. Yeah, same here. I, I've gone. I've had a lot of because I've lived in the same area a long time, so a lot of my childhood places that had a lot of snakes are now gone. And I've gone there. You know, I've seen them starting to bulldoze, and I go there, and it just it's kind of dead. So and especially after they come through, it's all just gone. And you'll see a lot of. Um, dead animals on the road. Like today I was coming home and on one of my favorite areas to get out and hike and sometimes cruise one of the roads, uh, they had started clear cutting along the tree line and a beautiful uh, southern pine snake had just came out and got hit. So I was pretty upset about that one today because they're not a very abundant snake in Florida. Yeah, no kidding. I, uh, and I always hate seeing, you know, DOR dead on road as, uh, as common terminolo terminology has said. Um, finding dead animals on the road is just, especially reptiles, just always kills me. It's like, ugh, why do people... <laughs> and Chip can speak to this, especially from uh, Anza Borrego, when it's desert season, it's like there's enough cars on the S2 to... Ugh, and you'll just drive for, it seems like, miles, and it's just snake after snake or lizard after lizard just squashed. Just because people want to go out and ride ATVs or dune buggies or whatever. And now speaking of uh, DORs and uh, road kills and stuff like that, do either one of you actually collect those uh, to look at later on, maybe for scale counts or you know bone collection or what have you? Uh, Rhett, if you would like yeah. first. I'll uh, pick up. Uh, like sometimes I skin a rattlesnake if it's a really pretty diamondback, okay. or um, you know take rattles, things, things like that. Right. But um, not usually. Sometimes I do, depending okay. if it's been rare. Like if I want to look at it, then I usually just throw it away. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And Chip, how about you, sir? All depends on what it is and what project I'm working on. If, uh, <laughs> if, we're, if we're told to pick up everything uh, I've done before, um, you know, now that I'm on the study that I'm doing now, if it was a speckled rattlesnake, I'd grab it for tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if it was anything else, unless it was something that was maybe a, a you know a range extension or something, I I likely would just leave it. I'd toss it off the side of the road so that another animal didn't get hit while trying to eat it. But I I wouldn't collect like say a Western Diamondback that was DOR. Okay, very good. Yeah, hey, you and, do uh, eat animals. Eating, you, sometimes you'll find snakes eating other DORs on the road. Like cottonmouths will come out and they'll crawl around and eat dead frogs and other snakes. I've seen that a few times. And uh, little ribbon snakes, they'll come out and eat frogs. I've, and then they'll get DOR'd in the process of trying to get a DOR. Oh. Uh, Jeez. You just can't catch a break. <laughs> now, uh, not to reverse the conversation, but uh, we did have a mention uh, from Christine Kilroy on Facebook uh, when we were talking about the lucky field herping equipment and what have you. Um, her dad, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read the note here. Uh, looks like her dad gave her a snake hook uh, when she was growing up, 
uh, that she still actually carries around today. Oh, wait, I think Jimmy just pulled it up. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, so she said, I don't have an interesting, uh, any interesting field herping stories, but she does have a snake hook that belonged to her father that she takes out with her every time she goes out to look for critters. So that's very cool. Uh, anyone else have anything passed on from uh, anyone else in the field herping realms that they use today? I'm the only field herper in my family, so... My parents are friendly to animals, but <laughs> no one really took an interest in them, in the reptiles. I like how he said that. My parents are friendly to animals. <laughs> Just don't like reptiles too much. Yeah, they're, they're not they're not that fond of them, but they don't hate them. Well, that's so. a good thing. Yeah. So now I'm awesome. And Chip, any uh, any, any uh, heirlooms passed on from uh, generations gone by for you? No, I'm I'm the first one that was that got really big into this. Uh, my parents, you know, they they like animals, but uh, they weren't you know field herpers. Okay, fair enough. Now, uh, being uh, out in the field all the time and speaking with Chip earlier about the permits and things for foreign countries, um, how? How do you guys go about if you come across, as I'm sure you do, private property, you know, that either wasn't on the map or, you know, didn't wasn't noticed last time you came up, and now there's this barbed wire fence that says marked private property. Do we just jump the fence, or do we actually go about the normal procedure and contact the landlord and say, hey, can we go over there? I'll uh, I'll contact the owners only because I don't want to get in trouble and potentially lose access to the area. Um, I don't have too much of an issue with that. There's a lot of public land um, on most of these mountain ranges out here in the west, or it's um, you know like state park or national park. So mm -hmm. then I'll have to actually go through and get permits from this. Um, like for instance, um, herping the uh, the Phoenix Mountains, which is one of my study sites for. Um, mm -hmm the Speckled Rattlesnake Project, I had to go get city park permits to get access to that. Wow. So um, for me, it's a lot of it's open public land, so I could just use that. But uh, when it's not, then I'll, I'll get the proper permits. Okay. <laughs> and one of our commenters wants to know, do DORs count as fines? Not That's to me, they don't. <laughs> not to Rhett, they don't. Okay. I yeah, mean, I don't, they count as I've seen I don't a personally count them, but it's up to you. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Rhett, as far as you're concerned, uh, do you just jump the fence, or do you actually go get your permission? Um, <laughs> and we're not judging anyone here, so if you jump the fence, hey, that, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, luckily, in Florida, there's a lot of uh, public land. And you can go and just, uh, there's a lot of state parks, wildlife management areas, and uh, also just um, water management districts that you can just walk onto. Um, also, just talking about reptiles with people every now and again, you know, not everyone's a big fan of wild snakes. So a lot of people be like, oh, I saw this snake in my yard, or I have this hunting, this big plot that me and my family hunt on, and we have so-and-so snakes here. And it's happened a few times. We talk to people, and as long as we go there and, remove every snake we find. I've gotten access to private property that way. So, what? Do you actually remove them? Yeah. Even um, there was this one we were, uh, he's, this, this old guy in North Florida, he sets all his uh, tins and stuff on the edge of the field because uh, my friend convinced him that if uh, you keep the cover off your property and you put it on the woods, the snakes will stay there in the woods. So we get to go over there and flip it. And he even makes us take out little teeny ringneck snakes. It's kind of funny, but yeah, we go there and we flip them and we take all the snakes we find and usually re relocate them. And he actually lay, lays the artificial cover, or AC, yeah. out for you to, yeah, and, to flip. And he, yeah, and he follows us around. He finds it interesting, but every snake has to go. We found three ringnecks under one piece, you know, little teeny ringneck snakes. They're not more than a foot at most, and usually like eight inches or so. And... My friend's like, oh, can we uh, release these? Or you don't want these to go. He's like, no, they grow. No, well, no, this is full grown. He's like, they need to go. They need to go. So all snakes need to go. Wow, so, he's going to be infested with rodents here pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. 
people don't always understand the benefits of snakes, the positive benefits. Well, snakes would just keep coming back, so at least you get a lifetime of herp in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've free herp and can't can't argue about that. That's got to be fun. It absolutely. is. Now, as far as um, with your gentleman's findings, what is, uh, already? I think I already know Chip's answer to this, but we're going to ask it anyway. What <laughs> what information are you specifically collecting? And no, Chip, we don't need the entire list. Just to generalize, background would be great. Thanks. <laughs> so a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do GPS coordinates. Um, you know, I depending on which species it is, um, they'll get brought back and processed, and all the normal body measurements will be taken. I'll take venom samples, scale clips. Um, but if I'm just out for fun, I'll take GPS coordinates and weather data at different, like at 1.5 meters, substrate temperature, um, things like that. Okay. And Rhett, what about you, sir? What what uh, what do you look for? What do you measure if you're out there measuring stuff? Nice pictures. That's that that's about uh, when I when I got there. And if it's a uh, it's a snake that I've been looking for, I'll find um, a species in a different spot I haven't seen. I usually write it down. I have like well, a list of what's where, and occasionally a GPS coordinate if it's something significant, just so I can go back and hunt that area again. Okay. Now. Um, as far as artificial cover is concerned, uh, we were talking about the tin and stuff like that with Rhett earlier. Uh, Chip, do you find uh, putting out any cover like that will work, or is there specific types of cover that you look for or actually place in the wild, or do you just go completely natural? If I out? happen to come across some, then I'll you know flip it, but I'm usually out really far in the middle of nowhere. And yeah. Well, haven't placed anything, so uh, it's usually just in you know pretty nice wild natural habitat. I mean, obviously, it's in some of my sites. It's Southern California, so there's house a ton of housing going up to the base of these mountains. So you do occasionally come across artificial cover. Um, I'll look at it when I'm there, um, but yeah, usually a lot of my sites because my snakes like it really hot and dry. There's there's not too many people out by where I'm at except for, you know, Phoenix or San Diego area. Right. And, Britt, what about you, sir? Oh, yeah, I, I place cover because in Florida it's a really good, uh, it's a snake attractant. Sometimes we'll throw corn if we get, like, big boards and put it under if there are corn so the rats will go in there and make nests and then the snakes come in. And different kinds of snakes like different kind of cover. Like, um, every now and again I'll go south to the lake area and I'll bring uh, carpet with me and throw carpet out for Florida Kings. In the Florida Kings, it's just like a magnet. You put on the edge of the canals, and, I mean, if you put enough carpet, you're going to get some king snakes. And then, I mean, tins are golden, but you can only get so many tins. And every now and again, if I'm going down the road and I see a nice sign that's starting to go over, I might get out and help them go. <laughs> <laughs> so I come back a little bit. That's happened to me occasionally. <laughs> Oh, there was yeah. actually a really good spot with artificial cover that was a trash site, and I don't know if you ever went to it, John, but that was right down there in uh, San Diego County, right close to the border with Mexico, and uh, it got all bulldozed under and is now a parking lot, but oh. that was a great place to go for uh, Southern Pacific rattlesnakes and king snakes, but uh, that was one artificial cover place that I would occasionally stop in at. Just when I was out, I'd make sure to do like the loop around and hit that on the way back, and just to check out, you know, what was there. But that got lost. I think, oh man, what maybe two or two years ago? I think I, I have a photo up somewhere. I have to check for the date, but oh. yeah, it's not a parking lot. Completely, uh, hundred percent level. No, no life of any kind for a while. So that's unfortunate. Oh man, such a sad loss. And, and they're just encroaching further and further. <clears throat> now, as far as um, licensing and legal issues, we talked a little bit about that. Um, what are some of the other, I guess, legal issues that the field herpers may run into, other than you know the obvious having the permits to collect uh, certain species with snakes? Is there anything else that we should be watching for, other than private property or you know having the proper permits to go out and collect? What are some of the other hazards of field herping? 
protected species. Like in Florida, people um, like indigo snakes are protected. And people who don't, I guess, get out a lot, if they find an indigo, I see these a lot online, like someone's holding an indigo snake. And that's called, you know, that's harassing an animal or molesting it, I guess. And the same thing, like little alligators, those are protected. Even gopher tortoises, you're not supposed to touch any of those species. So you can get a lot of trouble for taking photos and posting them online of you holding a protected species. Wow. Yeah. And Chip, I guess that would go back to the point of some locations actually stating that, you know, even, like you said, picking it up and moving it across the road could technically be called, you know, molesting the animal and get yourself in trouble that way. Yeah, it's all state-by-state state basis. You'd have to look in on each one and what their particular laws were <coughs> and then follow the ones for that state. Um, otherwise, yeah, you could end up... Uh, posting photos of you doing illegal activity online. That would be bad. And uh, let's see, we have a question here. Do any of you have experience finding eastern indigos? If so, what is the best time of year, weather conditions, etc.? I would love to photograph these in the wild. Okay, now, not to go against our commenter, but this actually brings up one of the subjects that I did want to cover about, you know, field herpers revealing their spots. Do we do it? Do we not do it? What is your guys' thinking on this? Um, we'll start with Rhett first. You know, do we share I, spots or not at all? I, 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 don't, I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't even share a black racer spot. Like I wouldn't share, you know, a garter snake spot because you never know what someone's intentions are. Um, word of mouth spread, you know, spreads really fast. Right. And you know, I. I've made the mistake before of telling someone that was a friend, and they told somebody, and next thing I know, I see other people on my road. And some people collect reptiles, and the last thing I want is people collecting from my spots. Oh, that's, oh my computer's dying for some reason. I must have unplugged it. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, Rick's back. That's good. Yeah. So, no, I mean, I've got a couple really close uh, herping friends, and we tell each other our spots, and if somebody else were to just give away one of our secret spots, they would be never talked to again. But there's a lot of spots that um, are kind of common knowledge, like if you read the field herp forums and a lot of the pages that people talk about, like national forests and what species are found there, there's a lot of that common knowledge out there. Like everyone knows, you know, South Florida and what's there and North Florida and the different different spots, but besides that, some people like to share um, counties, like, oh, this was found in this county, and at least here, I can typically, if someone posts a county and I know what species they're after, I can find a general location or a good guess to where they're at, so that's why I don't even like to do county. county wow. Okay. And Chip, what about you, sir? Um, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. I have some really, you know, a small close circle of friends that I, you know, will share anything with. In particular, you know, one guy that I, you know, first started going and looking for stuff with in Arizona when I first moved there. And, you know, him and I found a lot of our first of different species together. So we've put in a lot of time together. I also know that he, you know, doesn't go and collect animals, so I don't have an issue with him knowing. And he also doesn't share information on places we find. Um, I have, like, different tiers of sites, like, and then different species. You know, if, you're, if you want to come out and you want to find a Western Dimeback, I mean, we can easily go do that pretty much anywhere. You know, I'll, I'll give you some road that I know tons of people go cruise all the time, even if I, you know, don't know you. I'll be like, hey, you know, go, like Mount Hopkins. Everybody knows Mount Hopkins Road. You pretty much have to have been living in a cave <laughs> to not know that road. I mean, it, there's a caravan any night in the summer, especially on a weekend. So if there's a species that somebody wants and I don't know them, I'll just be, and if I know it's going to be there, I'll be like, you know, go, go to Hopkins. You know, yeah. I'll tell them that. Well, um, <laughs> If well, everybody, everybody's going to know that road now because you just put it worldwide. <laughs> Every, everybody knows that road. That is not that's not any secret road. No, um, no. But if there was a, uh, you know, like if there's a species say that I studied and it existed in a park somewhere where I knew that had protection, let's say like Saguaro National Park, and maybe they really wanted to go find you know said species, I wouldn't have an issue, you know, inviting them out if we were going to that study site in particular, because I know that if they tried to go back and do something wrong, there's a high probability of, you know, people getting, you know, busted. So I would 
allow more people to come to a, you know, hey, let's go find as many as we can in this park in that specific area than I would if it was an area that wasn't protected. Because I wouldn't want somebody then going out later hitting that spot back up when there's no one there to, you know, look in after the place. Gotcha. That makes sense. All righty. Well, let's go back to Rhett since you're in Florida and the question was about eastern indigos. And you, yes. don't, ha you don't have to give anything, but my understanding, and you're out in the field a lot more than I am here in Florida, but my understanding, the best time to find them is typically in the late winter, sometimes during the winter time, because the males are on the move wanting to breed. So if you're looking for heavy males, um, typically the winter time in Florida is really good for indigos. Is that kind of fall what you're saying? Yeah, that that's true. And also you got to think about it. That's that's a big black snake, and out in the heat of the summer, it's not going to do as well as in the. They're cold tolerant, so yeah, they're a uh, winter time find. And the sand hills habitat is where you'd want to look for them in the sand hills, and cover a lot of ground because you know, especially the males, they have a large territory. I forget the exact acreage, but it's quite a bit, like 300 acres, I want to say, something like that. They'll range, because there's a lot of radio telemetry studies done on them. That's, it's a fairly large range. Yeah. I mean, I mean, granted, they're big snakes anyway, so. Yeah, they're really big snakes. They're pretty impressive, beautiful snakes to see in the wild. So. I couldn't even imagine seeing those things in the wild. I'd probably fall over. <laughs> oh, that, that was one of my most memorable finds was my first indigo as a kid. I was I was riding my bike because um you know we were talking you hiked and then I started riding my bike as I got older and I was riding my bike down this little uh, trail on the side of the trail I saw what looked like a tire because it was just a big black coiled up snake I just jumped off my bike I just stood there in awe of like oh my gosh this is the greatest thing of my life and it was it was probably only about a five foot snake and I had to have been about. 12 years old or something like that, so it was kind of intimidating, and I'm, I'm walking up, and I'm like, oh, do I tail this, and he like, look at me, but he didn't do any defensive postures, and he just crawled, and I just followed him for a while, and it was definitely one of the most memorable moments of my life, so. That is awesome. I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine finding an indigo snake as, a, as, even today as an adult. I mean, just seeing one in the wild would just blow my mind. I mean, I'm floored. I've only I've seen, seen the captivity, and they're just awesome snakes. I've seen many of the Florida herpers this year um, photographing indigos. Lots and lots of indigos this year. Um, and, and talk to a lot of people early spring, January, February, because we're kind of chilly most of the time. Yeah. So, um, a lot of mm, indigo finds. Is. Nothing really big on the big side, though. Um, pretty much everything I've seen posted from any of the guys have been in four foot, five foot range. Nothing too much larger than that. Um, what about you, Rhett? Have you found any up around that seven foot, six, seven foot range? The last one I saw was I haven't seen any of this year. It was a couple years ago I saw one. He was I, he was about six foot two, six foot four. It was a really, really beautiful, healthy one. Uh, one of my friends who I just saw my North Florida photos. I was up there with one of my friends, and he actually caught one of the largest ones in like 50 years. It was exactly eight feet. And you've probably seen a photo flying around somewhere on the internet of the giant indigo, but he found that one in central Florida. And that would have been just an incredible animal to see. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you saw it in pictures, though. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen all the... They like rubbing it in my face. It's like a black <laughs> python, basically. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Chip, what would be your uh, favorite field herping memory? Oh, favorite field herping memory. Um, I'd actually probably say the uh, the first black mamba I ever found in the wild. That'd be my yeah. favorite. Uh, the reason behind that is is I uh, I had a book when I was a little kid, and I I know we 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 were in New York, so I must have been at least five or six, it would have been probably five or six, and it, it had, you know, a section on black mambas, and I, you know, had told myself, I was like, one of these days, I, I have to go find one of those in the wild. So I, uh, I was living in a, a country called Swaziland for a, a few months, and the, uh, I had been out hiking, it was kind of towards the tailing end of their season, like right before I got there, they were getting call-outs all the time for them, and they kind of started to die down when I got there, but 
I didn't like call outs wouldn't count. I had to go find one on my you know feet hiking around, and I spent miles and miles and miles. And you can actually smell them. They smell a little bit like curry, so you can you can smell like where they actually spend a lot of time. And I would try you know being in the in the morning at this site one time, and then if that didn't work, well then I would try the morning at the other site, and then I would try the afternoon at the first site. And I had struck out and struck out and struck out over and over and over again. I was actually really angry and hiking back to my uh, my campsite so I could go and get some food. And I came around this corner, and there was one just across the path. And it, um, it kind of gave that little bit of a rear up, and it tilts its head and flattens its neck and slightly opens the mouth. And I stood there trying to get my backpack off as slow as I could so I could get the camera out. So I'm just sl barely sliding it off as it's sli you know slipping off the side of the trail. And uh, I didn't get any great shots of it, but I had a great time you know following it around, watching it crawl in the bushes for about you know five to ten minutes. So that was, pro that was probably my favorite. Wow. Yeah, that would do it. I'm definitely into the venomous stuff. <laughs> Black Mama would definitely do it. Yeah, I'm jealous of that one. That's pretty awesome. Man, I remember my first Diamondback was pretty memorable. It was um, I was young, probably 14. I was in Georgia with my brother, and we were riding a little tandem bicycle, looking for snakes all day together. And we went to the uh, on the sand dunes. We're walking around the sand dunes, and I'm like, oh, this is a great place. There's got to be here, got to be one here somewhere. We're we're just hiking and hiking. And I remember in between two tufts of the uh, large wire grass, I just saw this big dark mass out of the corner of my eye and I look over and I just remember taking focus and I'm like, oh my god, there it is. It was just this big, huge, well not huge, it was probably about a five, five and a half foot diving back. But that was really exciting and we got a stick and we pulled it out of there and it was rattling and striking at us and that was definitely a memorable, because I love venomous snakes too, so that was a big memorable moment for me. Yeah, yeah definitely a western diving back, that large, well, any western uh, diving back. It was an easy one. The Eastern Diamondback. Or Eastern, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, West Coast, East Coast, whatever, it's all same. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Only for what? polar bears in Canada. Hey, yeah. whatever. You don't even know nothing about Chile. Talking about Chile in Florida. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and, uh, Rhett, what would be your most embarrassing field herping moment? <sighs> I'm sure you could probably get a better answer from one of my friends. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we all could get better answers from some of our friends, but... There was one time, I would say a small alligator ended up in the boat with us. Somehow, just getting it out, and I dropped it, and it flopped around on me, crawling on my face and over my shoulder. Um, I'm sure some good falls and trips and stuff like that, but I, I can't think of any really good ones that someone else could probably embarrass me better. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I just don't want to admit them or talk about them. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, I've been a victim of uh, cactus and, uh, oh, I've discovered what harvester ants are. Oh, yeah. That was, that, that, was a, that was a great find of mine. Uh, definitely one of my most embarrassing moments because I was, as we all do, busting my friend's chops about him you know, whining and crying about, you know, getting stung by an ant. That was until I got stung by same said species and understood the pain of involved in harvester ants things. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Chip? Any uh, adventures in cactus and, uh, any, you know, anything like that? Oh, I've had plenty of cactus into me. I've been st I usually get stung at least once a year by a harvester ant. Um, oh, God. I don't know. As far as uh, as far as embarrassing, I don't really I, I don't really consider it embarrassing it anymore because everybody knows the story. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was spending an entire night cuddling with Mike Rochford in the Sierra del Nido so we didn't freeze to death would probably be as close to as something that would be an actual like embarrassing story, I guess. Yeah, no. Yeah. We didn't have enough gear. We we driven in the Sierra del Nido. We were uh, hoping to go find the uh, del Nido Originos rattlesnake, and we had thought we'd found roads that would get us in, so we thought we'd be car camping. So we hadn't brought backpacking gear. Um, instead, I just found a farmer that was willing to let us park on his land 
and I traded him some Tecate for, you know, allowing us to park there. And we set off, like, unprepared as far as gear-wise because we pared everything down to fit in the maximum amount of food and water. And then it decided to get really, 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 really cold. So we spent a night with a, I think it dropped to, like, 39 degrees. And between us, we had one, one sleeping bag and a tent with no pads. So that was one of the most miserable nights of my entire life was uh, wow. almost freezing to death out there. Bet you you couldn't wait till the sun came up to warm up. <laughs> that was the most awesome time <laughs> of, the past, of the 24 hours that we uh, had spent cold. And, and, you know, that actually brings up another good question for the field herpers. Um, what would be, uh, say, one of the top five things that you would tell a newbie who wanted to get into field herping? If any, Rhett, you want to answer that one first? Um, top five things, I guess. And it does, and believe me, you don't have to actually name off five things. I was just throwing out a random number. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I guess it'd be um, you know research, do your research, because like as a kid, I just I just read so many books, like you know all those little Florida Fabulous and Alan Tennant and Dick Bartlett's, and I just read so many books. And then, you know, just, you know, research which animals live in which types of habitat, learn to identify the habitat, um, read about which weather conditions are best if you're trying to optimize, you know, the, the amount of snakes you're going to see, or reptiles for that matter, and just get out there and spend time in the field and get used to looking for individual animals or the ha learn the habits of the animals. I guess you have to be out in the field to uh, really put your research to use. Fair enough. That makes sense. I yeah, appreciate that. Uh, Chip, anything from you as far as tips for uh, newbie field herpers that uh, they must abide by? <laughs> Carry plenty of water. Uh, get a really really good pair of boots. You should spend most of your money on boots. Um, and then, yeah, I'd say research. Like Back to his point that he was talking about of how you know when he started, he read a bunch of books. I have seen a huge difference and how discussions go from when I first got online doing like you send out those free AOL discs to now that everybody has it and there's a lot more reptile forums. They used to go with everybody had already read the books. So there was a lot more of like finer point questions. Now because of how easy it is to access information, you see a lot more of I want to find X, give me the formula so I will find it. And then you see those people, you know, everybody will come in and attack those people with we won't share. But I remember seeing, like, when people had done more research, you seemed to get more help from people. Mm -hmm. And it was probably because you'd put in some of the work yourself as opposed to, hey, I just want to show up and, you know, slay everything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, do a ton of research. Awesome. And it looks like we have another message. Uh... This one actually goes with uh, uh, chips there. Um, oh, okay. I don't know. Uh, she's basically asking, do you have a favorite social media site or group that you would recommend for field herpers? Um, I personally don't. Um, there's a bunch of them on Facebook, but for a specific group just to deal with, uh, I don't have any. Do any of the panelists? John, do you? Uh, not personally. I don't have a real um, field herp forum that I would go to. Um, I no, no, not see, for me. No. I I think you know field herping. We see a lot of people post their their in situ pictures, um, pictures online. It's so easy nowadays to actually become friends with them and um, start talking to them. And, and if you're somewhat knowledgeable, they'll pick it up real quick, and it'll be easy to share little tidbits and information. And, and it's about building that trust issue. Um, and, and with any friendships, I mean, regardless of, of what it is, I think the best is if you're really looking to find one species or something like that you just kind of go with guys that have been posting that species and you introduce yourself and, and 
you're not looking for a specific way or, or a specific location, but to help learn about those animals. Um, so for a, a specific site, not really. I don't have any. Um, Rhett, do you? Uh, the field herb forum. That's I, I don't post on there, but I usually just post on Facebook. That's the only place I really do to my local herb society and then my personal page. Yeah. Right, Central Florida, Central Florida Herb Society. Uh, um, I see you posting on there, and a bunch of your friends post on there too. And yeah. Paula Cummings, um, just go to that site. I mean, you can like the site. You don't even have to be a member, and you know, get in contact with some of the guys on there. They're they're actually pretty good. So, um, actually, Rhett, we have another guy here for a question for you, and uh, I'll bring it up. And he says, uh, where is one place you guys haven't been herping at that you would like to go one day? And I would imagine it, you know, it's an open world. So, Oh, wow. that That's kind of like endless, just about <laughs> yeah, I was anywhere say. I haven't been, basically. There's no reptile, snake, turtle, lizard I don't want to see. But I guess definitely on top of my list, I'm, I'm pretty jealous of Chip out in Africa or Swaziland. Is that in Africa? <laughs> Australia. Um, I've been to Central America a few times with family, but I really love to go to the Amazon and look for this, you know, Bushmaster. That's on the top of my list. Is a uh, Bushmaster, um, probably a King Cobra, and stuff like that. So, so you got a laundry list of, of things yeah. you want to go find. Yeah, Bushmaster's definitely on the life list. Before I die, I have to go to uh, Central America and find one. So, take me with you, Rhett, please. Yeah, <laughs> that's one on my life list too. And yeah. speaking of life list, uh, Chip, what's on your life list? And also, where have where have you not been herping that you do want to go? Uh, as far as how, where I have not been and things I haven't found that I really want to get. Um, Angola and Democratic Republic of Congo are two countries I really, really want to get to. Um, I really want to find a gold tree cobra is my number one. And then uh, I would also love to get to Komodo to go see Komodo dragons. That's something I have to do before I die. Um, as far as what's on my life list, it's I, it would take forever to list, so a lot. Um, I primarily go after... You know, I'll, I'll set off for venomous species, and the rest is kind of bycatch. That's cool. So that's what makes up the majority of mine is whatever I find while stumbling around looking for venomous stuff. I forgot the Galapagos. I gotta go to the Galapagos before I die because I love tortoises. So that's definitely up there. Very definitely. Very definitely. What about you, John? Other than Bushmaster, any other special places? Oh gosh, uh, probably Malaysia in in Southeast Asia. Uh, some of the Asian snakes are really intriguing to me. Um, I would actually like to work with or uh, put hands on a sea snake at some point, um, just to say I did it. Uh, probably wouldn't do it without uh, somebody like Doctor Fry standing right next to me, just because I know his skill level with the sea snakes. Outside of that, I don't trust people working with venomous snakes around me, um, unless I know them personally and have had a lot of experience with them. Just because accidents happen, I don't want to be a statistic. <laughs> yep, yep. I guess, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of one in particular that I have to on my life list go see, and um, it always winds up being a tricolor of some sort for some reason. I don't understand why, but uh, um, I don't there's know a little tantilla species that I actually found out, and it's down around the Costa Rican area, and it's a tricolor tantilla species, and that's pretty really? much um, maybe eight inches long. I mean, you guys are talking big, you know, cobras and, and Komodo dragons, and here I want to go find a Tantilla species, so um, kind of weird, but, you know, I've caught Eastern Milk, Scarlet Kings, you know, um, I'd like to do a little bit of herping out west for um, some New Mexican milks, um, stuff like that, but 
I like those small, intricate species. Um, so that would probably be my main one. Very cool. I, mean, I, I love tricolors too. I gotta admit, I really love tricolors. So those are would definitely be a plus anywhere I went. Now, um, when you when either one of you uh, gents go out, is is there always a specific species you're looking for, or do you ever just go just to be outside and just go and hang out in nature and chase reptiles? Usually there's a specific species for me, and it's whichever one I'm studying at the time. Yeah. Um, so as of lately, it's always speckled rattlesnakes for the most part. Um, but, there, I mean, there's times when I definitely go out and it's just whatever. But even when I'm going out for fun, a lot of the times I'll, you know, either maybe be trying to find something that either hasn't been found in an area um, or something I personally haven't seen yet. So there's usually, usually a goal, but uh, it doesn't, you know, override everything else. It doesn't stop me from enjoying other species I come across. Sure. And we have another question. Uh, yeah, this one's directed at Rhett. And it's from Herper X1986 on YouTube there, and it says, "Rhett, I'm also in Florida. Have you ever found any invasive species invasives in the glades? I think I've seen you at Repticons. Not going to lie, I only remember you because you're always with your hot girlfriend. <laughs> so, any um, any invasive species from the glades? Yeah, I found a lot of invasive species down there. I mean, it's it's kind of the attractant to go there." Um, uh, some pythons, uh, shoot, all kinds of lizards, red-headed agamas, basilis, iguanas, nidinals, day geckos. I mean, the list goes on, but I guess the main thing is everyone cares about is pythons. So, and I, I mean, I couldn't even think of all the species off the top of my head. Mostly lizards, yeah, all different species of invasive lizard, but yeah, some pythons and that's about it. Well, heck, we can pretty much go in our backyard here in Florida and find invasive species, yeah. brown anoles, Cuban tree frogs. I mean, they're all over the place. I heard about all the species of geckos, toke geckos, all the – I mean, there's just so many. I'd have to – Now there's some in Fort Myers area down that way. Uh, yeah. Chameleons, veiled chameleons. Yeah, yeah, veiled chameleons. I've never spent too much time – like, I know where the chameleons are. I've really never been too – they're on private property, so I haven't really felt – like going after those, I usually spend my whole night looking for snakes. That's my main focus. Right. Yeah. What about you, Chip? Do you find any uh, invasive species uh, throughout your trips? Yeah, there's some chameleon populations here in California that I've gone and found some chameleons at. They have Jacksons. Uh, I found Jackson chameleons in Hawaii. Uh, let's see, what other? Obviously, you know, living in Tucson, there's uh, the Mediterranean geckos everywhere. So, here and there, a couple things. Now, Chip, as far as the invasives are concerned, we know pretty much in Florida they're, um, you know, the python hunters and a few other people are licensed to go out and capture the invasives and then um, destroy them humanely, of course. Uh, is that the same thing that you're doing as well? If, if you do find invasive species, do you guys automatically just take it out of the wild, or is that something that you just call somebody else to take care of, or how does that usually work? Uh, bullfrogs usually meet their end, but okay. uh, the chameleons, I mean, nah, they're living in housing communities, and the best we know, they're not actually venturing out into, you know, the coastal sage scrub, so nobody's really too worried about them here, although uh, apparently in Hawaii, they're having some pretty bad impacts on the uh, native snail populations, so I don't know if anybody's doing anything about them out there. But as far as me, unless it's like a bullfrog, I've I've only really you know gone and found the chameleons. So it's not like there we I've there's no snake populations I can think of that are out here that right. are actually invasive. For sure. And Rhett, what about you, sir? Well, in the in the Everglades National Park itself, you have to be licensed to actually uh, remove the pythons because everything in the park is protected. So if I see them in there, I leave them. I I typically a lot of the places I hunt are already like agriculturally disturbed areas. Mm -hmm. so I haven't really gone in. I'm not going to go fill sacks full of basilisk lizards because they're not supposed to be there. They don't. They're living in a drainage field anyhow. Um, the one invasive species I do have a war on is Cuban tree frogs. 
because um, those guys, they get in there and they sit, live in the same little niche that the native tree frogs live in and they eat them. I've seen them on my front porch when I first moved in a few years ago. I didn't have any native tree frogs. All I had were big Cuban tree frogs by my lights and I could hear native ones off in the distance. So I put in time and every time it would rain I'd hear them calling. I've been collecting all the Cubans and I've started catching things like barking tree frogs and squirrels and greens and brought them back in and now I have barking tree frogs breeding in my yard. I've got squirrels and I've got all natives. I still have a few Cubans flooding in but um, they meet their end. I've got a hognose snake that takes care of them. So <laughs> I, <don't... laughs> I kind of do the same thing. I mean my house is just covered with Cubans and when I first moved in 12 years ago uh, very rarely I, I'd see some greens and but now it's just been Cubans and they meet the freezer. Um, yeah. and, and Florida, actually, Florida has a piece of paper that you can fill out, mail into them. They they actually ask you if you catch them, and you know that it's a Cuban to actually freeze it. Yeah, they they tell you right there in the paper. So oh, if you live I've, in Florida and you see Cubans and you know they're Cuban tree frogs, they hit the freezer. Yeah, I've seen them eat the native tree frogs. I've walked out my porch. After I've had all the natives come back, and I see one big Cuban tree frog stuffing a little green tree frog in his mouth, and I'm like, no, why would you, you oh know, <laughs> try and pull it out? Freezer too. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. All right, Jimmy, over to you, sir. What do we got? Um, I think we're good. Um, maybe uh, our uh, silent assassin, as they're calling uh, Chad over there on YouTube. Uh, you got any questions about social media popping up? Not really. Um, just uh, a lot of comments tonight. Really good. Um, let's see. So no questions. I got. I have YouTube mm -hmm. covered. So. Um, yeah, no questions and answers. Um, but uh, yeah. Send cheesecake. <laughs> All right, that's an inside joke uh, uh, between John and I and Chad, well, and I'm actually, I'm actually gonna, uh, I'm actually gonna tell the world all about this joke. So, <laughs> Chad, Chad and his cheesecake. So, what was it, John? Uh, our second show was it uh, while we were in a green room? Yeah, I think it was. I think, I think it was, it was our cake second cake. show, and, and I open up the room and we bring all the panelists in. And here I am, and I'm working with some of the panelists, and here I am, and I look up, and here Chad is eating cheesecake in front of all the panelists. <laughs> so from now on, it's all about sending cheesecake. So Chad said he was out doing something. He'd run a little late coming in tonight. So I was like, yeah, pick me up some cheesecake on your way in. Well, the thing so. is, when I'm on here, I, I forget that I'm on the camera, and I close that window on. I'm looking at all the comments on Facebook and everywhere else. So I'm sitting there right up on the screen, and I forget you guys can see me. So, yeah, we're eating away, reading the comments. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, Chad. I like that. Give me a little giggle after the rough week I had. Um, so let's see here. I think I think that's it on questions for them. Audience, if you have anything, uh, pop in any questions. I do have, I, I do have a question that's going to concern um, Chip out west. Um, do you, in your studies, uh, when you collect data, is it a, a specific list of data that you collect, or I'm, I'm sure you have a pretty much big outline of what you have to, but it, do you collect more than what's um, required? It, it all depends on what you're studying and what questions you're trying to answer. Um, for the rattlesnakes, I have you know, potential side projects that I might eventually think about doing. So I'm collecting data that's not just, you know, the, you know, the venom and then like a tissue sample for genetics. So I'll take, you know, snout vent length and measure how much it weighs and all sorts of other different body measurements that I could eventually do something with. But, you know, other times we're just doing like, say, um, a species survey. So we're not actually putting our hands physically on any of the animals. We might be going out there and walking through a canyon and, you know, putting down um, how many of each lizard we see so we can, you know, see if um, species assemblages change over time. Or we maybe will be putting in, or we'll also then maybe sometimes collect where 
did we find that lizard? Was it on like a trunk of a tree and how high up, or was it on the ground? You know, what what time? Things like that. So it all depends on what you're actually looking at and what you're trying to answer. Now, Rhett, do you do you keep any kind of data? I mean, I, I know you're pretty much a hands-off and, and picture guy, but uh, do you collect any data on the, on the animals you find? Um, besides location, not too much. No, I mean, I, I write down um, what snakes I saw where, what reptiles I saw where, and sometimes I'll write male, female, if it's a notable snake, and not too much data now. Because I know there's uh, other field herpers that do a lot of data collection, and, and some of that data collection is, you know, as and Chip was saying, you know, not just for studies, but, you know, snout the vent length, male, female. Um, I also know a lot that do weather conditions and temperatures and humidity levels and um, moon cycles, and they keep records of all this stuff, and you can actually find patterns in certain certain species that you find. So if you're out there field herping, you know, collect as much data as you can. I mean, it's easy nowadays. You can set it all up on your cell phone and just kind of punch it in. You'll be surprised how much uh, collecting data will help you later on. I know a lot of you guys started younger. Uh, Rhett, you started when you were younger. Some of us old folks, you know, in the mid-30s, uh, maybe getting out there and... Um, for the first couple times in our lives, but uh, um, I find collecting data even in private co collections. You know, I, I see a year on year on off type thing um, with females. So collecting data is always good. Um, you can always go back and look at it. What's your thoughts on collecting data, there, John? Actually, I wanted to ask uh, Chip and Rep both. Um, speaking of technology, how much has technology changed the way you feel hurt, say, tomorrow versus when you first started. Obviously, it's made leaps and bounds. But, Rhett, with you uh, specifically, how how much has it changed your field herping, oh. either your capabilities or your abilities to, you know, explore various areas? Oh, well, one of the biggest things, like uh, Chip said earlier, Google Earth. You're able to do street view, and you can look at individual, like, habitats. You can get a close view without actually having to go to the place. You can scout out different habitats for, I guess, you know, you have maps and stuff, but you've got actual pictures, and you can put the little guy on the ground and walk roads to see what the exact specific terrain you want to hike is looking like. So, I mean, that, that in and of itself has just changed it completely. I also saw that Google is also doing um, some of the major trails now that they have uh, hikers actually with the little cameras, uh, round cameras, and they're actually doing yeah. the trails. So I wonder how, how long that will be before they have those images up line too. Wow. I didn't hear about that. That's amazing. So, Chip, how, much, uh, how has it changed for you as far as uh, technology and when you first started? Yeah, Google Earth's the biggest one. I went from, you know, topographic maps or just, you know, driving out and hoping that the the road I picked would get me into a decent canyon to uh, using Google Earth and mapping out my trips sometimes before I even, you know, have ever even gone to the mountain range. I'll have picked out a bunch of spots and gotten myself directions on how to get to each one so that if I show up and it's not quite what I want, I can bounce to the next one really quick and hit that one up. So that's, that's that would be the biggest one. Very cool. Now, as far as, um, and this is kind of, within the technology question, but also outside of it, um, as far as the forums and online communities that have developed over the years, do you think that's been a, a blessing or a curse to field herping in general? Uh, Rhett, you first? Kind of both. I mean, there's so much information out there that it can be either used for good or it can be used for bad. So if somebody wants to go collect a snake, they know where to go collect, even if it's a rare snake. If you do enough research, you know, and you just read forums, you can really learn a lot. So kind of gotcha. good, kind of bad. I mean, it's really good that everybody can, you know, you've got the social networks. I've liked that part a lot, is being able to meet other herpers and stuff. Before that, I kind of just snake out with a couple close friends like I do now, but I couldn't really share my experiences with other people. And I, I didn't even 
talk to other people about snakes before social media, but it also has its downside. So. Gotcha. What about you, Chip? Yeah, it's, it's definitely both. Um, I mean, I've, I've never in my entire life gotten a message from someone saying, hey, I want to co come find X species. I'm going to collect every single one I find, destroy the habitat while I'm looking for it, and, you know, go back and tell every single person I ever know where to go to find those things. It's always, I'm only for pictures, um, I don't collect anything, and I'll never <coughs> tell a whole. However... I mean, even, you know, I, I moved to Arizona in 2002 when I started my undergrad at University of Arizona, and there is spots in particular for, like, say, Willard Eye that were amazing to go to in 2002, and as the years have gone by, there they, are still snakes there, but there's not the number of animals quite there that there used to be. There's, uh, you know, destroyed habitat and it's not even specifically affecting the species they're after. I mean, they have to think of other fossorial snakes that when they go rip up a rock hillside, you've now completely changed the microhabitat, and you're affecting species like Tantilla and other things like that that, uh, that also utilize that habitat. You know, that's a good point. I, I forgot about that. Here in Florida, we've got a lot of trees. A lot of people like to go around peeling bark and tearing apart the trees, and so many other animals are using that you know, the dead tree to go through and it just, it ruins habitat. I, I would personally rather not find that snake than destroy habitat for other animals. Because sometimes, I mean, as a kid, I ripped through logs a lot before I really knew about it. And I'd find lizard eggs and snake eggs and stuff. And looking back, it's like, oh, I'm destroying habitat. And I guess our logs are kind of like your rocks. So. Yeah, for sure. I, I would say that would be the one best thing that social media could do would be to... Um, have people who have, you know, done it a little bit longer really harp on the ethical ways to move through an area. Um, I mean, I realize that some people, you know, that's that you are spoiled living in, you know, certain places of the country. If you're from Maine and you're only going to get that, you know, once a year or once every, you know, couple years trip to one of these, you know, destinations that you really want to go to, I, I see why some people, you know, aren't as nice on the habitat because they don't themselves plan on going back. But they need to realize that there's a bunch of other people that are also doing that same thing. And if they want to go and see these things 20 years from now or take their children to go see these things, they've got to be softer on the habitat as they move through. And I, I would like to see the Internet be used for that purpose, but the problem is, is it just takes one bad person to screw it up for all the good ones. So I'm not really sure how effective it would be. Very good point. And I do have to agree with you 100% on that, Chip, as far as, and Rip as well, both stated, you know, the uh, habitat destruction by the only what I consider invasive species, which is humans here on the planet, um, was something that's touched on in a couple of articles, actually, in Herb House magazine, uh, by uh, one of our authors, Melissa Coakley, talking about, you know, if you do flip a rock or flip a piece of tin or a board, put it back. I mean, what does it take? Five seconds to, you know, you look under it, you put it back. It's not rocket science, and it's not that hard. You don't need to, you know, clear-cut a forest to go find a snake, folks. I don't know. Uh, we have a question here from Kate Eddy. Is that right, Jimmy? That's right. Okay. I've noticed while herping here in North Carolina, if I'm on the east side of the PD River, I see lots of cotton mouse and timber rattlers. On the west side of the PD River, I have yet to find a cotton mouth or timber rattler, but there are copperheads everywhere. Do you guys have any input as to why this would be? Uh, we'll go with, I don't know, Rhett, you want to answer that one? Slight, yeah, s slight differences in habitat that I guess he's not recognizing. Uh, cotton moss like a little more wet than copperheads do, and I don't have a lot of experience with copperheads because I have to drive about five hours to see them. And okay. what I've noticed they like to stay out of the water a lot more and around the dead logs and debris where they can, you know, be really cryptic and stuff. Um, I see a lot of that around here too. There's, there's, um. 
this one lake that I grew up on, and one side of it is just covered in pygmy rattlesnakes, just covered in it. And the other side, there's I've never seen one in my entire life of living on that lake. So, I mean, just slight, probably more water on one side is why he's got cotton mouths and more debris for the copperheads to live on the other side. All right. And, uh, Chip, any insight from your side? I agree with Brett. There's some sort of habitat difference that he's probably not quite picking up on, so that's the perfect time to take a bunch of data on maybe what plants are associated within, you know, a certain um, distance around the snake. You could keep data on exactly where the snake was found, what plant species were there, um, you know, where was it found? Are you, you know, down in a drainage? Are you up, uh, you know, on a bluff? Um, you can even, you know, further outscope that past that and say, like, the plants that are right there with the snake, plant species that are, you know, within five meters of the snake. And if you keep enough records like that, you'll start eventually piecing together that, hey, maybe, um, you know, when I'm finding timber rattlesnakes, there's always, you know, X species in the general vicinity or things like that. So, I mean, you still, I mean, you see a lot of studies published where that's exactly what they've done in certain areas. They'll go in and say, like, you know, if there's a kangaroo rat midden, well, that's where I have a, you know, a high association of X species. If there's this, it's a different one. So it's it's perfect study if, you know, you're in college, it could be a project. If you're uh, in high school, you could start it. Sounds like an awesome project to me. I'm... I'm... <laughs> and that brings me to a study that was actually just released not too long ago on king snakes and um, copperheads. They said that king snakes were falling off, but copperheads were increasing. But it was the basis of what they were using to collect these snakes. I mean, they were they were using traps where you know copperheads are caught mostly in traps. You don't catch a lot of king snakes in traps. So you really have to look at the data and collect as much data as you can to really determine what what you're really looking at and, and kind of pinpoint it. So um, just because one is one, you kind of have to take all that data and, and lay it out in front of you. And, you know, this day and age, it's easy. You don't have to plot them on graphs anymore. You just punch the numbers in and hit a button and it'll put it, and put it all up for you. So Very true. So um, now something we like to do with all of our guests uh, towards the end of the show is ask uh, one specific question. Jimmy, did you want to ask it or you want me to ask it? Actually, you can go ahead and ask it. Um, I think both. I think both our panelists. I know, uh, Rhett. Do you keep uh, uh, captive animals? A few, not many. I've got a few that I use for like educational talks and stuff like that, and uh, some turtles. Go but ahead. I I think uh, I think we're all into the. All right. Famous question. All right. So basically, uh, famous question for reptile living room is: if money was no object or uh, money and size were no object, what would be the ultimate reptile that you would keep? Uh, mine would be, uh, I'm, I'm kind of torn. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, Galapagos tortoise, a huge one, like just the biggest Galapagos tortoise, uh, or a crocodile or a bushmaster. Galapagos tortoise is number one. Fair so, enough. And uh, Chip, you, sir? Uh, gold Tree Cobra and uh, Fees Viper. Fees Viper, nice. That one's definitely not too common. Have you ever worked with those, actually, just out of curiosity? Fees, no. Okay. Damn. All right. <laughs> and, James, we all know what you keep. You, you just want to keep, you know. Hey, if it's got red on it and black on it. <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's ready to be in my collection. You know, we I don't think have we ever asked Chad this question? I don't think so. I don't think we've ever asked Chad this question. I think we should ask Chad. Chad, come on, spit it out. Hey, it's, it's gonna be lame. If it was uh, if it was anything I could have, um, it wasn't an object to be spotted turtles or bog turtles. I like the small, simple things. Something I you know grew up around seeing, and I like them. They're just, they're all protected, but I'd love to have them. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, hey, I do want to give a shout out to my son. He uh, 
got our, today was the last day of school, so this perfect show he'll be watching uh, next week. We're going to be herping all week, actually all summer now. So say hi to Gilly, and uh, hope he enjoys the show. Hello, Gilly. <laughs> Good to see you on board. Good luck field herping next week with Dad. That should be fun. Yeah, he's going to show Dad up. Oh, yeah, he he found the first snake of the season. Did he really? Yeah. yeah and, uh, <clears throat> and speaking of which, uh, as far as seasons are concerned, um, throwing it back to the panel real quick before we let uh, let these kind gentlemen go, is there a specific season that you enjoy more than another as far as field herping goes? Uh, Chip, let's start with you. Not really. No? Uh, okay. I'm always out, so... <laughs> Not really. I, I prefer the weekdays when, it's yeah. depending, on, depending on where I'm at and what I'm doing, I prefer weekdays because that means there's less people out. But I actually, I, I rarely run into people, so. True. Yeah, I've seen some of your study sites. There's not a whole lot of, there's not a whole lot of population around some of those places, but. <laughs> and uh, Rhett, you sir, any favorite season to go field herping or? Spring and fall seem to be the best seasons in Florida. Okay. So especially the once it warms up in those first couple rains, those are my favorite time to get out. And also because you haven't seen as much stuff over winter, you get out spring, snakes start moving, and that's my favorite time. And then fall, it picks back up really good. Very cool. Very cool. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate your time. Um, Jimmy, any final closing thoughts, sir? No, I just want to thank our panelists. Um, Jeff, Mintz, too bad we couldn't get your mic going. We're going to have to get you on on another one. We'll be planning another talk um, sometime in the fall. So we're going to try to get some more field herpers on. Poppy, welcome back. Some of you guys, again, for the show, appreciate you coming on and, and spending the two hours with us. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Uh, Reddit was great having you on board. Chip, good to see you again, sir. Uh, I'll hopefully eventually get back to California at some point uh, so we can actually do that field herping uh, trip we had talked about out in Ansborego <laughs> at some point. Who knows when, but, you know, I'll try to make it happen. <laughs> thank you all for being on the show. Greatly appreciated. Good to see everybody's doing well. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot, guys. It was a great show. Yeah. Thanks for having me on here as well. All right, guys. We'll talk to you again. Have a great night. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks, everybody.